For public health agencies and White House officials, Northeastern researchers are trusted sources for modeling the COVID-19 outbreak. To discuss this important work, Northeastern President Joseph Aoun and Network Science Institute Director Alessandro Vespignani join us live now. Good day. Uh, I'm joined today with uh, Dr. Alex Vespignani, who is the holder of uh, the Sternberg family uh, chair, is a distinguished professor at Northeastern and the director of our Network Sciences Institute. As you know, the White House and the CDC have selected five universities to advise them on COVID-19 and uh, the Network Sciences Institute, led by Dr. Vespignani, is one of the five. So they have in, been advising not only the White House and the CDC, but also international organizations and foundations such as the Gate Foundations and others on the, what you know the progress and the lack of with respect to uh, the COVID-19 crisis worldwide. So welcome, Alex. It's great to be with you again. Good afternoon, Joseph. It's, uh, it's great to talk to you. I, I didn't mention good afternoon, good morning, because we have a worldwide audience oh, listening to yep. you. So good, wherever good you day, are, good, good day. day. Good day, good day. Yeah, yeah that's wherever right. you are. <laughs> so Alex, could you uh, tell us a little bit where we are today? What's your assessment? Let's start with the United States and then go to uh, the world as a whole. Uh, well, so the situation is uh, complex and we are still in the in the midst of the storm, in a sense. It's, uh, uh, as you know, in Europe now, the, the, some of the countries are starting to reopen and a lot of discussion in the United States is about reopening. Uh, unfortunately, the signals are, are how they conflicted. Uh, we see that overall nationally, there is an improvement in the number of uh, deaths that we record that is plateauing and, and tend to decrease. But in some of the states, unfortunately, we see the opposite trend. And actually, we see uh, an increasing uh, uh, direction for, for, for fatalities. Uh, also, uh, some states have started to reopen part of the business, some others are not, and so the situation is quite heterogeneous. It will be crucial in the next few weeks to see what's going on and to see what, what is uh, coming to us. Uh, the rest of the world, the situation is even more complex. There are places like South America where the epidemic is uh, uh, getting, uh, uh, how to say, steam now. Uh, Africa will uh, 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 start to report cases and the number of cases is increasing, although they will have generally probably the big wave a little later. And the, the last thing that is worth uh, mentioning is that in the Far East, in Japan, South Korea, Hong Kong, Singapore, China, where the epidemic, the epidemic went down because of the very aggressive social distancing that they did, when they started to reopen, uh, they started to have, again, cases. And so, you know, this is a, how to say, is a warning for us that we need to be very careful in, uh, in, in the way that we strategize about reopening our societies. So today, for instance, uh, there, there is a, a scientist uh, at the WHO who said that uh, COVID-19 is going to be endemic, it's going to be with us for a long time and society will get used to it so don't expect it to disappear in a year or two years and he said in the same way that we are living now with hiv even though that we are able to uh, control and minimize uh, the dreadful impact uh, of uh, hiv is still with us and other uh, viruses in general uh, you know are in a similar situation and do, what, what's your, what do you think of that? Is it going to be the case that we are going to live with COVID-19 for uh, many years to come? Well, coronaviruses are with us uh, since, since a long time. There are human coronavirus that have been circulating in the population every year. Uh, they are seasonal uh, viruses. Uh, uh, what will happen is that likely these coronaviruses might become endemic and be widespread in the population. But 
it will be a complete different story down the road. It's important not to, how to say, I don't want to send the wrong message to people and they have to think that, uh, you know, for the next five years, we'll have to shelter in place and, and be terrified at this virus. This virus now is very, very dangerous because the entire population is susceptible. And so when it starts spreading in the population, it generates a huge wave. It's a kind of tsunami of cases uh, that uh, is going uh, to overwhelm the healthcare systems. And this is why we are very careful in doing social distancing. We want that every person that gets sick will get the proper care and especially intensive care if needed. When a large part of the fra fraction of the population will be, uh, uh, will be exposed to the virus at least once, then the virus will circulate at much lower levels. We will have to be careful because we will, uh, the still it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a serious uh, disease, uh, especially for uh, uh, elderly people or people with pre-existing conditions and comorbidities, but you know, the impact will be extremely different. The other thing is that in the next few months, I'm pretty sure that we will develop therapeutics. Uh, so we will have drugs, we will have way to treat uh, the, the, the cases uh, that will help a lot the treatment. And the final, uh, uh, weapon that we have is uh, the vaccine. And so we all hope that, you know, within one year, we will be able to, uh, to deliver vaccine in large quantities to the, to the world population. So Alex, people mentioned some models, you know, like South Korea, people talked about, uh, uh, also New Zealand, uh, people mentioned the Swedish approach that is very different. Could you uh, explain to us those different approaches, which one is working, which one has to be uh, refined? What are the issues that we, uh, those models are facing? Yeah, those are very different. So, the, you know, Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, South Korea, they went for an approach that is strongly, very aggressive in uh, mitigating uh, the, the, the virus spreading by doing extensive uh, uh, testing, uh, tracing treatment approach. And that means that you really test a lot of people. You go and try to find all the, and trace all the contacts of them. You do preemptive isolation of those cases. And, uh, and they were able to keep the disease at a very low level. That is a very time consuming and needs a lot of resources and effort. And I think is the way where that you spare life. There is another approach uh, uh, that is the, 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 the Swedish approach. The Swedish approach is to say, well, we try to mitigate as much as we can the epidemic, but we let it run in the population. What they want to do is to build herd, what we call herd immunity. So the disease, uh, the, the, the virus will fade away after you know a large fraction of the population has been infected because it will not find a host to 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 infect and that is what you know obviously lead to a decrease of the disease but unfortunately implies that all the people that eventually have to die because of the disease will die and mm -hmm. that's uh, this is based on you know in a sense uh, sacrificing some part of the population that will develop complications additionally since you have to protect the healthcare system what happens is that uh, you have to put strict rules on who really is allowed to get critical care and who is not allowed to get critical care and so these are draconian decisions that uh, again are made on lives unfortunately there is another approach that is the one that is to try to uh, balance those two in a way that, you know, we try to keep the virus, uh, uh, how to say, to crush the virus as much as we can, bring it down, keep, uh, make an effort for five, six months of tracing and, uh, and treatment and testing, and then get finally to the, to the vaccine. That is an approach that, again, is... Uh, Plenty of resources have to be devoted to this approach, but uh, you know it can really spare a large number of, of lives. So, Alex, you know you have been mentioned all over the press. Uh, you have been in the news and on many studies, but one of them has said, "Look, the world actually faced uh, COVID nineteen earlier than we uh, thought," and you know you showed how it was in the United States, it was in other countries, whatever it is. Why didn't we spot the COVID-19 early on? What, what, 
why is it the case what they needed you to come and tell us look this is COVID-19 and it has been it is with us and it has been with us very early on what did you know that they didn't well you know what we know is uh, is the numerical models uh, uh, and uh, uh, what we uh, had at that time was the situation in China, and it was possible to generate large-scale simulations of the trajectory of the epidemics across the world, as you would do for the trajectory of a hurricane, uh, you know, and you have uncertainty because it's you are looking at, uh, at the future, but, you know, you see that the epidemic was... Uh, uh, undetected in several places in the world. So we were estimating hundreds of cases of undetected infections. This is a disease that unfortunately has asymptomatic cases, uh, subclinical cases. They are almost impossible to detect. And, uh, and at that time, no country in the world had the capabilities to do large scale testing. And so the guidelines were to test, to test people based on travel history. So if you were arriving from China and you were sick, you were tested, otherwise not. That uh, unfortunately has led the epidemic in, in, in spread in a, I would say, I, I, I always use this term, invisible way for January and February until March when we started to understand when the evidence was there because you start to see uh, people dying in hospitals and uh, cases emerge uh, in clusters. And so the testing at that point was ramped up in order to detect more cases. And then this is where we are now. So the model at that point was a way to look at the invisible. The model is able to look at the invisible because it tracks individuals traveling across the world. Uh, it tracks the invisible infections. Uh, what he says is, uh, yeah, why, why the people didn't act before? Uh, well, you know, we knew, the modeling community knew that, and many agencies knew that. But then you have to put yourself in the shoes of policymakers. Policymakers had, at that point, the idea of, uh, you know, numerical models telling them that there were thousands of infections that were invisible. And we were saying, you know, in weeks you will have deaths, but they were not yet there. And it's very difficult to take a decision like, shutting down a country, stopping economic activities on something that is just invisible, something that is in a numerical model. I always say, you know, meteorologists have one big advantage with respect to us. They have always a big, nice satellite picture, photo of, of, of the hurricane out there in the sea. And so you know that there is a, a danger out there. What we go when we talk to policymakers is, okay, we have these models, we have those numbers, but there is no picture or photo that you can have of those. And so that makes a makes difference. I think and I hope that this experience was a learning experience for all of us, including the policymakers, the way we talk in, in the sense that the next time we'll try not to repeat those, uh, those, uh, those errors. And so, so what that, are the lessons learned, Alex? What are the lessons learned? So for next time, what do we need to keep in mind? What do we need to activate earlier? What, what if you can well, walk us? <laughs> well, you know, it's many, many years that we are saying everybody, you know, we need to have preparation for the next pandemic. And, uh, you know, from time to time we got always, yes, it's important, but there are many other priorities. And, you know, I think this is really uh, an example of how in an interconnected world like we are, we are all on the same boat and the pandemic now everywhere in the world uh, is uh, in the time scale of a couple of months uh, all over the, the, the rest of, uh, of, 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 of the you, affecting the older, all the other countries. And we need to have infrastructure in place. We need to have, for instance, what I call a national, we have national weather services, no? We know we have those. Why we don't have a national, you know, uh, pandemic forecasting uh, uh, observatory? Uh, why we don't have that in every country in the world? Why we don't have, you know, uh, uh, the capacity to, uh, to move resources and, uh, and energies in a way uh, against the pandemic that is uh, almost automatic at this point. You know, if you think yeah. about the last 20 years, we had one pandemic, one flu pandemic in 2009. We have uh, SARS, we had MERS, we had Zika, 
we have now COVID. So this is not rare events. We were lucky in previous uh, instances. This time, uh, this is really, we see how deadly and disruptive they can be. So we need to be better prepared. So I, 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 <clears throat> I received a series of questions. Uh, with the first one, and actually those questions uh, can be merged. The first one has to do with the data. What kind of data uh, do you use in your models? Uh, the second one is uh, about the key metrics we should be observing and how do your teams keep up with the uh, changing environment, the constant changing environment here? <laughs> and so, wow. you know. Okay, let's start from the data. Data, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's crucial. And what we need, first of all, is data about the world. We need uh, population data, census data. We need mobility data. That goes from uh, airline data that uh, that we can get from uh, from official databases in real time, to more you know commuting patterns, uh, uh, human mobility that we can track from uh, uh, from mobile devices. Uh, uh, all that tells about the whereabouts of us because we are the carriers of an epidemic the other thing that we need is data on the disease each disease it's a, a story by itself and we need and this was one of the problem with covid we didn't have all the data initially about the disease because it was the first time appearing on the world you know so that's something what is the incubation time what is the infectiousness uh, what is the the asymptomatic transmissions versus the symptomatic mm -hmm. transmissions all things that we have learned in those months and some of them are still unfortunately uncertain we have still uns some some gray areas that we would like to uh, to improve uh, the other question was about uh, how we change uh, and cope with uh, with the environment that change well there are many things that we have to consider uh, first of all is people uh, awareness uh, our uh, you know let me tell you you know I, I was saying that with respect to meteorology we were unlucky because we don't have the 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 the, the picture the, the photo of the hurricane but we are lucky in another sense because you know the trajectory of the hurricane is unchangeable. It doesn't, we cannot do anything against a hurricane to change uh, the, its trajectory. With a pandemic, we can change its trajectory. So what we do as humans, uh, you know, makes uh, an impact on, on the trajectory of the pandemic. And this is what we have to factor in in the model. This is the changing environment, policies, what the governors of a state does, what a, uh, a president of a country uh, does. Uh, what we do as single individuals do we stay home do we avoid contact with other people are we aware of the dangers of a disease do we wear masks and, and gloves so all that is something that uh, is to be factored in the model and this is what we we do what is the effort now that is the 24 7 work that we are doing is to monitor those changes monitor those policies and bring in the model so that we can change the model constantly Okay, so, you know, we have two questions and, you know, you can really link them because one is how, your modeling of Ebola, how did it inform the COVID model? And the other is how is the pandemic uh, affecting how modeling is going to be approached and used in the future? You know, some of your colleagues have been very criticized for their yeah. model. They had to change the refined models so how, how so if we look at first uh, your own journey and then we look at uh, the, you know the modeling in general as a field you know why why is it so controversial now well you know there is again if we think about meteorology and and what we do with infectious disease there is a 50 years difference uh, mm -hmm. That makes uh, a lot of development that uh, we are doing at the moment. And so we started 20 years ago. We are operationalizing a forecast for the flu uh, in the last few years. And, uh, you know, uh, one of the questions was about Ebola. And yes, Ebola was one way to learn a lot about models, how to improve models, how, what are the limits of modeling. And this is still things that we are learning now. What is our time horizon? <clears throat> Joseph, if you if i tell you what will be the weather in uh, in in three months you will laugh
me and you know that I'm, I'm a charlatan, no? You know, you would say, oh, Alex, come on. You know, so if I tell you what will be, you know, the evolution of this epidemic in uh, in, in two years, again, I'm, I'm not, you know, you don't have to believe me. You know, we need to understand better what is the, 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 the level of uncertainty the more you push, you know, far in the time horizon, your 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 prediction. How you can improve, uh, or uh, what are the, the the most important element? And this is all things that we are going through. This is what is important at the moment. It's uh, in a sense uh, some models have been criticized because they were readjusting themselves to new evidence. But this is normal at this stage. You know, the world is changing, and as we were discussing before, you know, the the the, the policies are changing, and what we know about the virus is changing and so we need to recalibrate models as well as we we do with uh, uh, with this exercise it's important to also to to think that there are two ways of working for us one is what we, I call the war time like now everything you do is on a cycle of 24 hours uh, you know uh, what you do now you don't have time to to refine and perhaps change the day after and then that will be the time for research when we will go into into peace time then we will develop new tools so we will learn from this lesson and produce better infrastructure for the next time and so this is what we need we need to do well th 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 thank you alex for that i there are two questions uh, that are addressed to me one is, uh, you know, will Northeastern have testing? Absolutely, we will have testing. We will have, you know, not only testing, you know, everything we, we're doing is going to change. You know, we are go looking at the density in the classroom. We are going to look at the density in uh, the dorms. We uh, have secured additional 2,000 beds in order to take care uh, of uh, the density issue. We have to look at our athletic events. We have to look at the density throughout the campus the food courts, everything. It's not going to be business as usual. Also, you know, how would, you know, the question about how will campus life be different in the future? You know, we are a community and a communi in a community, we're all responsible for each other. Yeah, I share with, with, uh, with our community at large worldwide what we are planning to do, and I'll have the opportunity to come back and share that with you. But now I want to focus in the last four minutes on uh, Alex uh, himself and what he has been doing. You, uh, Alex, how do you become Alex Vespignani? <laughs> what does he mean? <laughs> how, how, do, how do I go into this field? What do I have to study? Oh, do well, I you know, I, I, my training was as a, as a physicist and I've done uh, physics, uh, you know, condensed matter physics uh, uh, simulations for about 10 years. And then I got uh, into network science. Uh, you know, network is a big component of physics. I mean, you know, atoms and materials are forming networks. But then we had uh, uh, the, the the fantastic work of colleagues uh, of our colleagues at Northeastern University, like Laszlo Barabashi, who has put forward ideas for network and their importance, uh, you know, in many, many other areas, especially social sciences. So I got interested in network and in computer networks and social networks on uh, digital social networks. From there, you know, now 20 years ago, I, I got uh, some uh, results and work on computer viruses. And then from computer viruses, I get into the actual biological viruses. Uh, and from there, now it's 20 years that I'm working on uh, on the spread of infection diseases by using network concept um, methodology coming from physics, from computer science to understand computer viruses. That's, I have a question that's relevant you can elaborate on, on and that's the last question uh, that we will take today and we'll do it again. Why is network science well suited for disease modeling? Well, the virus is spreading on a network and the network is our invisible connections when we talk, when we are in the same room, when we share a, a space in our household. So this is the network, the contact patterns that keep the social fabric together and the virus needs that social fabric. And then there is another kind of larger network, how we move, how we go from one place to another. You know, you take a plane from Boston and go to Paris. And this is a network of flow of people. So the network is crucial to describe how infectious disease spread. And this is what we do. And this is what we give us, you know, the algorithms and the methodologies to face 
the, the, the analysis and forecast of the spreading of diseases. Yeah, I, I think, I think, you know, this uh, network sciences uh, history at Northeastern is an interesting history. Some years ago, we started building this network with Laszlo Barabashi, with Alex Vespignani, with David Lazar. And by all reckoning, this is the premier network sciences group in the world, and uh, they are impacting the world. So let me close with the following story. At some point, you know, I, I, we all knew that uh, Alex Vespignani and his team and his labs were in constant demand. So I, one day I called him and I said, Alex, how are you doing? He said, you know, Joseph, I, things are, are re really going well, but I don't think I'm going to be able to keep up with all the demands. And I may have to close uh, my uh, operation uh, with respect to that restricted uh, in a very significant way. And I asked him why. He said, because th the demand is coming from the city, the state, the federal government, the foundations, the uh, world at large, you know, foundations such as the case interested in in, the, in Africa, in uh, Asia, in you know, Afghanistan, Pakistan, etc. And I can't meet the demand. So we asked him, I said, what, what do you need? He said, it, yeah, there are two, two, two factors I need. I need the human factor, more researchers to help me and help us. And at the same time, you know, we need more computing power. So, uh, I, you know, as I mentioned to you at the beginning of uh, this session, uh, Alex is the holder of uh, the Sternberg family chair. So I called Cy Sternberg and I say, Cy, Alex needs your help now. Without any hesitation, on the phone, side committed a substantial uh, sum of money to help uh, uh, Alex. So I connected them both on, on uh, the phone, by phone. It was two, you know, three phones at work here. And when I mentioned that to Alex, and Alex didn't know that, he cried, I cried, but he was able to move forward with his uh, lab. And another uh, trustee, uh, Jim Polota, also stepped forward to help him. So. After that, we the whole community mobilized because we put together a fund. We, we called it the COVID-19 Resilience Fund in order to support our students and in order to support the research that Alex Vespignani and other researchers at Northeastern are doing to help us solve the COVID-19 crisis. The community as a whole worldwide stepped up and is helping. So I, on behalf of uh, Alex, on behalf of uh, the older scientists working on COVID-19, uh, we want to thank you all for not only for being together with us today, but also for stepping up and helping uh, solve this crisis. So thank you. And thank you, Alex. It's always great to be with you. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you to all the people who have supported us in the past months. And I, I mean, you know, donors, uh, uh, the staff, all the people that have really uh, helped us in, uh, in, 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 in working and, and try to make a difference in the past months and probably uh, in the future. So I, 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 I'm deeply grateful and thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being with us today. We'll do it again. Take care. Bye. Thank you.